personal finance PowerPoint presentation. Credit Shelter Trust, CST. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Most of this information comes from Investopedia, Credit Shelter Trust, CST, which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This by James Chen, updated July 16th, 2022. In prior presentations, we've been looking at estate planning, then focusing in on particular tools used in estate planning, which may or may not be applicable depending on your circumstances and situations. This time, that being the Credit Shelter Trust. First question, what is a Credit Shelter Trust CST? A Credit Shelter Trust CST is designed to allow affluent couples to reduce or completely avoid estate taxes when passing assets to heirs, typically the couple's children. So we went over kind of like a timeline of the process for the estate planning in prior presentations. Quick recap, before the time of death, our goals are typically to be able to allocate our assets in accordance with our wishes at the point of death and to be able to make that process as easy as possible on our loved ones, our heirs at that point. And if we have a significant amount of assets, we might be subject to estate taxes. We would like to lower the use uh, or the amount of taxes that are being paid because theoretically, of course, we'd want to be giving more of our money to the people that we want to give the money to. Keeping that in mind, we're now looking at a credit shelter trust designed to allow affluent couples, people that are well off, the reason it's more affluent couples is because the estate tax, which you might think of as like a death tax, which is a tax in essence on the balance sheet, as opposed to what we're typically thinking of with taxes, which is an income tax. So you got the balance sheet or the assets at the point of death accumulating. If they're significant enough, you could be subject to the estate taxes. And so more wealthy individuals are gonna have more concerns about that to reduce or completely avoid the estate taxes, basically the death tax that would be on the assets of the, the, the estate at death when passed to the heirs. So, so this type of irre irrevocable trust is structured so that upon death of the truster's creator or settler, the assets specified in the trust agreement and the income they generate are transferred to the settler's spouse. So remember, normally when you think about passing on your assets at the point of death, the first tool we think of is a will. But if you have a will, then you could still be subject to basically the probate process, which can be kind of a costly process. And uh, you, you might have other strategies with regards to, of course, estate planning as well. So you might use tools such as trusts, trusts being similar to like a corporation in that they're kind of like a separate legal entity in a way they're, they're an entity in and of themselves, which have characteristics that we typically apply to human beings, such as the capacity to own property. And so that could have some useful uh, applications with regards to estate planning, one of them being setting up a trust to try to make the probate process a little bit easier. And then when we get into more complex estate planning to try to reduce estate taxes, we might try to put our money into a trust uh, to reduce the taxes. Now, remember that this whole thing with the estate taxes, the, the back and forth would be the IRS wants to tax a, a wealthy individual when as they die on basically their balance sheet. The wealthy individual then has an incentive to give all their money away on their deathbed. The government doesn't like that. So they're going to try to say that we've got a gift. Gift rules are going to be tied to the estate taxes so that we're going to limit your capacity to just give your money away right before you die. So then, of course, you have complex strategies to try to give your money away. One of them would be, well, what if I gave my money away to a separate legal entity, a trust? Well, you might be able to, to do some planning like that, but 
if you still have control over the trust, meaning it's revocable, you can change it at any time, then you haven't really given your money away would be the argument from the IRS. And that's why we have this concept of irrevocable trust. If it's in an irrevocable trust and you no longer have control over what to do with the money, although you've kind of set forth what you would like to do from, with the money, then that's when you're walking the line between uh, the estate planning and whether you gave the money away, which can be beneficial for estate taxes. Okay, keeping that in mind. Understanding a credit shelter trust. CSTs are created upon a married individual's death and funded with that person's entire estate or a portion of it as an outlined in the trust agreement. Uh, so these assets then flow to the surviving spouse. So remember, when you're talking about a couple, then you have a bit more complexities in terms of, of these asset allocations, right? Because if you're one individual, then you own what you own. And at the point of death, you know, you're going to do what you're going to do with it. When you're a married couple, then the question is, well, are you like one entity now, which is kind of the original thought of marriage, right? Now you're one like entity with regards to what your ownership and so on and so forth. But that concept can be a little bit different from state to state. If you were one entity, you would think that one person dies and they give the then the other person still alive so they would kind of have control over the assets of that financial entity and then when they die they pass the the assets along so and so forth in accordance with whatever they have set up but uh you have different different laws with regards to different states uh that you want to be aware of and also when you're talking about the taxes for the death taxes the estate taxes there's usually like an exemption amount which you can think of as kind of similar as an income tax standard deduction that you get on an individual basis. So if you think about the income tax standard deduction, usually you have like the standard deduction for single and married is like twice as much. But for estate taxes, they don't have that. It's just one exemption per person. So now, now the question is, well, if I'm married, I wanna make sure I get this the, the exemption the amount for both individuals, which can be a little bit complex because when the second individual dies, they're gonna have all the assets of the two individuals in their estate, unless you do something kind of kind of tricky with trusts, right? So that's one reason you might be put in the trust, which would be necessary to think about if you have a married couple with a significant amount of assets. So however, because the trust is managed by a designated trustee, the surviving spouse never actually takes control of the assets. So the idea is that the one person dies, they, th they put the money into a trust, so the other, so the other spouse never really gets control over it. So when they die, they don't have twice as much assets, you're gonna try to get the exemption or maximize the exemption on a per person basis that way. Therefore, the transfer does not add to the surviving spouse's taxable estate. So, so that means when the next spouse dies, hopefully they're only taxed on half of the estate or you can try to minimize the, the taxes in any case. So a key benefit to this type of trust is that the surviving spouse maintains certain rights to the trust assets during the re remainder of their life. So now the surviving spouse, what you would like to have happen is the surviving spouse still has as much control as possible over the, over the assets, but they're not going to be subject to the surviving spouse's estate is the general concept. Under specific circumstances, such as the need to fund certain medical and educational expenses, their surviving spouse can tap into the trust principal and not just income. So typically the trust would be set up so that the income would be, would be the thing that, you know, the terms of the trust that would then have access to possibly not the principal depending on the terms of the trust but under certain circumstances they might still have the capacity to tap into the principal so upon surviving spouse's death the trust's assets are transferred to the remaining beneficiaries without any estate tax uh, taxes levied that's the general idea that's what you want to have happen instead of them being combined in with the surviving spouse making them have a large lump sum which could make more of it subject to estate taxes so cst's uh, credit shelter trusts are known as ab trusts or bypass trusts so we've talked about them in terms of a different name in in prior presentations so just to clarify you might hear them name different things you've got the credit shelter trust also known as a b trust or bypass trusts this is because csts are essentially bypass trusts in which each spouse has a separate quote taxable end quote estate these estates are known as a trust and b trusts 
So the point is that you're trying to maximize when one spouse dies, the exemption, and so that so that you get kind of like, again, comparing it to the income tax, the standard deduction that would be applied to the two individuals uh, rather than just one that would be applied to the second individual when they die. Credit shelter trusts and tax protection. CSTs are designed so that couples can take full advantage of estate tax exemptions. Now remember, we can think of those exemptions as kind of similar as the standard deductions for the federal income taxes, our goal being to maximize the exemption amount of benefit we can get for the two individuals involved in a marriage. In 2021, the Generation Skipping Transfer Tax, GSTT exemption, was $11.7 million for individuals and $23.4 million for couples. Now, remember that when we're thinking about the estate tax, we know that if the government tries to apply an estate tax on a wealthy individual, the knee-jerk reaction will be for that individual to try to give all their money away right before they die so they don't have anything for the estate taxes on death. That means the government's gonna be trying to put rules in place tying together the concept of gifts and uh, and with the basically the estate taxes. Also note that these numbers, the 117 and the 23.4 million can look quite large when you're talking about the average uh, individual. So you might say, well, the average person may not be subject to the estate taxes, but a couple things to keep in mind. Note that the estate taxes and even the income tax when it was first put in place, but especially the estate tax when it was put in place was thought that it was only going to be applicable to very wealthy individuals, which you would think these days would be like billionaires. And uh, the 11.7, for example, is far from you know, a billionaire or a billion. And two, we also note that these numbers can change dramatically. So when you're doing the estate planning, depending on whatever the politics are at the particular time, they can change these numbers drastically. So you gotta take that into consideration when you're doing your estate uh, planning. So it was 11.58 million individual in 2020 and 23.16 million couples. So this, la uh, this lasts until December 31st, 2025, if Congress doesn't drastically update the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act before then. So note again, they try to put some consistency in it when they put these laws in place, they have, they have it going for some point in time, but there's been a lot of big swings <laughs> with regards to some of these limits. And we just don't know what's going to happen because politics will depend upon it or it will depend on politics. So benefits of credit shelter trusts. The credit shelter trust has advantages beyond estate tax planning. A CST protects assets of surviving spouse and provides flexibility in distribution. Asset protection. The CST protects the assets of a surviving spouse. For example, a surviving spouse's assets are susceptible to creditors and possible depletion by children or a new significant other. The CST protects the assets from creditors and from being inappropriately used by the surviving spouse, for example, to pay the debts of a new spouse or their children because now you've got the money that went from the one spouse that died into the trust, which has some restrictions on it. Whereas if it went just to the other spouse, then the other spouse has possibly more control to do whatever they want and possibly could be subject to, uh, to manipulation possibly from other, another uh, individual or whatever. So protecting the testamentary intent of the deceased spouse. In a blended family, each spouse may want to ensure that their share of the estate is passed to their chosen beneficiaries, children from a prior marriage, for example, and not just to the surviving spouse's beneficiaries. So we could have more complex family structures that we want to consider. And that could be the trusts could be useful to try to try to uh, care for those kind of needs. The CST can help with this flexibility and the trust distribution provisions. The trust language can incorporate a limited power of appointment for the surviving spouse. Thus, surviving spouse may distribute the assets among a class of beneficiaries, e.g. the issue of the deceased spouse. So an example is a child who did not need a special needs trust at the time the trust was drafted, but after the decedent spouse's death, a special needs trust was preferred. In this case, the surviving spouse would be able to appoint the assets to a new special needs trust to provide for that child. 
Maximize the deceased spouse's generation skipping tax GST exemption. So how can you get the most out of this process? The GST exemption is not portable. The bypass trust allocate the GST to a GST exempt bypass trust, preserving the GST exemption for lifetime children's trusts. So protecting growth on the assets from further estate tax on the surviving spouse's death. So in other words, when the one spouse dies, if the money is going into the trust, you've got the exemption at the point in time the money went into the trust. But from that point in time until the second spouse dies, you would accept, you would expect them that that, that money would be growing within the trust. And hopefully that the growth in that money in the trust is also not subject to the taxation or the estate tax when the second spouse dies because it was in the trust at the point in time of the first spouse. So if you have substantial growth after the death of the first spouse, because you're investing in assets that are now in the trust that grow substantially, then hopefully you can, you can gain a substantial amount of growth, which hopefully may not be subject to the estate taxes when the second spouse dies because that was the money that was in the trust and not subject to the estate tax at the point of death. So we have a 5 million property or stock portfolio can be allocated to the CST on the decedent spouse's death. So the portfolio can be used by the surviving spouse and can grow to 8 million, then pass free of the estate tax to the bypass trust beneficiaries. Uh, property tax benefits. A distribution to a child from a CST is considered a transfer from the decedent spouse and not the surviving spouse. The distribution can take advantage of the decedent spouse's $1 million non-resident parent-child property tax re uh, re reassessment exclusion. Uh, an additional $1 million in reassessment exclusion can benefit spouses who own valuable rental or vacation properties. Let's take a look at an example of a credit shelter trust. Suppose a husband and wife who have been married for several years each accumulate an estimate worth of $6 million and the husband sets up a credit shelter trust to be funded upon his death with his share of their combined estate. So before death, they set up their planning process, which includes the credit shelter trust. After the husband dies, his $6 million estate and any income it generated passes free of estate tax to his wife because it falls below the federal exemption. However, the transfer boosts the wife's net income to $12 million and past the estate tax exemption. So you can see where the problem is here because if the exemption is at the 12 million, then what you want to be able to do is maximize the two people's exemption. If it just passes to the wife, now she is over the 12 million, whereas if you can divide it out, it would be under the threshold, meaning if you could take advantage of the two exemptions. So because these assets were held in the trust outside of the wife's control, her taxable estate is still valued at 6 million and still within the state tax exemption. So you see what's happening here. If you combine them together, then at the point in time that the second uh, spouse dies, then they're going to be over because you have you have both of the income together. So what you want to be able to do is when the first person dies, try to maximize the amount of the exemption that would be applied to them. And then possibly the second one dies and only half of it would be subject to the exemption because the other would be in the trust, which isn't technically part of, of the second spouse's uh, estate at that point because it's in that separate legal entity would be the idea. Thus, she can pass on her assets to her children without paying an estate tax when she dies. How do I terminate a credit shelter trust? There are circumstances where if one spouse is deceased but the surviving spouse is still alive, the CST can be modified or terminated either by the trustee alone, by the trustee and all the beneficiaries, or by going to court. Consent of the beneficiaries is typically required. What happens when a credit shelter trust is uh, depleted? In some cases, the value of a first decedent's gross estate may be reduced by deductions for debts, funeral expenses, and expenses of administering the estate, and it may not be large enough to use the estate tax exemption in full. In that event, 
the unused exemption can be preserved for the surviving spouse if the first decedent's executor make a portability election on a timely file form 706 uh, United States estate and generation skipping transfer tax return.